Okay, what we're going to do here is a little uh, live refactoring exercise. Now, I have done this exercise in Java. In fact, I took the Java code that I started this exercise with before and just ported it to C++ as close as it was. And um, the reason I did this exercise in Java previously was because the state of automated refactoring in a Java IDE is farther along than C++. So we're going to have to do some things manually that I could have done more in a more automated way in Java, but that's okay. Uh, and it, the Java refactoring tool that I used was a, a Java IDE called IntelliJ that's made by the same company that makes ReSharper for C++. Um, and refactoring tools for C++ come from a variety of vendors. Microsoft has one for Visual Studio. Um, I don't, I think Xcode has some limited refactoring built into it by now. Um, there is batch refactoring with Clang Tidy, which is an open source tool. So uh, that's good for things like switching your code to use a uh, null pointer instead of like the null macro or zero, for instance, or switching all your type defs to a C11 using declaration. Uh, so for mass applying batch changes, uh, Clang Tidy is nice. But uh, when you're working on this kind of a problem, or you're trying to transform some code with a goal in mind, it's not so much a uh, modernization style transform that can be automated. It's more um, applying operations in the IDE. So let's take a look. I've got, um, here's the program. I've got a build directory and a source directory. Let's just go to the build directory. It's a hangman game. I've built a debug version of the game here. And it's just a little console application. Uh, guess letters by entering a letter and pressing return. There's no Z or a Q. So I'm starting to build a figure here. That's the, if the figure is completed, then I've been hung and I lose the game. This is, you know, if you've ever seen Wheel of Fortune, Wheel of Fortune is basically Hangman. So let's just keep making more wrong guesses. Uh, there is a T, no R. Let's see, is there, there's no D. Uh, U, I've already guessed U. Let's try P. Okay. So that's what happens when you lose. And if I run it again, the word is meatball. So that's what the winning path looks like. So if we take a look at our source code here, uh, we've got a CMake build. It's really straightforward. We have a minimum CMake version we're going to use with a project and a single source file that turns into the executable. So that's really simple. And our ex our source file here, let's make this a little bigger. It's just kind of a mess, right? It's just a bunch of global functions. There's no real abstraction to anything. There's just uh, all the game logic is mixed in here with the user interface code. Uh, you can see inside here that there's, you know, here's a bit of input. And then here's a bit of output and then here's some game logic and then here's a bit of output and here's some more output and some more and what's even weirder is the thing that makes you lose the part that said you lost is not in this function it's somewhere else it's up here you know this is the thing telling you that you lost so this code works, but it's not the greatest. Now, if you're a Visual Studio user, you might have already noticed that there's some things here differently than what you might be used to seeing. There are these little green squiggles, and these are coming from ReSharper for C++. And over here in my scroll bar, you'll see this. There's this green 
checkbox saying no errors or warnings. That's coming from ReSharper. And this little green bar down here is telling me, lining up with this green squiggle saying, it's possible for this code to throw an exception, but we haven't put a try catch in our main function to catch the exception. And the exception is coming from here. And in fact, if I, if I take this code out, you see that I get, now I get a red squiggle for this switch saying there's potentially uncovered code because the full range of values that can an int can take on is not covered by every branch of this switch statement. So that's what the default is doing there with the exception being thrown. So one problem, and this code exemplifies that, that you can see in a C++ program is, what if I want to write a test for any of this code? Well, it, it's inside main. I can't write a test and call the function main from another executable. So one of the first things that um, it, you do if you've got code inside main that you want to test is just call this something function something else like game main and then down here main Let's copy and paste the arguments here. We'll have main just return whatever game main does. And if we spilled that to make sure everything's... Ah, now it's saying... Now it's... So, the thing about main is main's a little funny in that it can be declared as returning an int, but... If you don't have a return statement in main, it's not an error. It will just return zero. The compiler will do that for you. But now that we moved main into a different function, now it actually has to return a value. So now we're compiling cleanly. So now I've got this function game main that I could call from a test. And, um, you know, maybe I think this name is not so great. Maybe I want to call it hangman main so I can use rename functionality and resharper to rename that function it picked up the reference down here and renamed the reference as well just double check that everything's fine by rebuilding that file and we're good so now if I wanted to write a test for this for this code I've done the first step which is to get it into a function that I could call from my test the next step is to get it into a source file that I can link against my test executable. Now I'm gonna show you in this exercise how you decouple code for testing. I'm not actually gonna write the tests. Um, so we can do this by, let's, we also know we're probably gonna want to do some stuff with this code. Right now it's declared as static functions inside this file. We might want to be able to call them from tests, so they would need to change their visibility to something that's not static, so we can call it from the test executable. But for now, um, I'm going to leave it in here because the, the, the focus of this refactoring exercise is to show you how to decouple things. I'm not necessarily going to go through all the steps of extracting things out and writing a test against it. But if you need to test main, the first thing to do is Get that stuff into another function so you can call that function instead of calling main and have main delegate to the extracted function. So that's a good first step. Let's uh, go over to our source directory. I've got a little git repo here. Let's lock in forward progress. Okay, always a good idea to lean on your source control system to give yourself a backstop because one of the difficulties of manually refactoring stuff is you may get yourself into a, a, a bind and not be able to 
go back to the last safe spot. So anytime you get to a safe spot, it's a good idea to commit those to your version control system. Remember, revisions, commits in your version control system, they're free. So use as many of them as you need. We did compile just that one little file, but we'll just build the whole thing to make sure that everything still links. <clears throat> it's only a single source file, so shouldn't be a problem, which it isn't. So we're good. Now, the next thing we want to do is start teasing apart the game logic from the user interface. And you see here is a function called select word. It's actually just hard coded to return meatball, which we saw was the, the word that we guessed correctly. But um, in a production system, you know, this, if this were a production version of hangman, this would be selecting a word randomly from a dictionary or so on. Um, we need to separate that. That's not, so the initial word that is going to be selected by the computer for the um, contestant to guess is not part of the game logic, but it is something that we need to abstract out. We've got it in a function right now, and that function isn't connected to anything that's going to give us a hard time testing because it's just returning us a constant. So that's all right. Uh, we've got some game logic and then a piece of output and some more output and then some input so we know these things they don't have to do with the game logic itself although we do have this weird business that um, this thing prints out when you've lost but you see that when we get down into the code here this is the logic that actually stops the game when you've exhausted your allowed guesses. So what we need to do is tease this stuff apart. Now, there's the old saying in computer science that every problem is solved with an extra level of indirection. And so that's what we're going to do. Our goal is to get uh, this user interface code, which right now works on the console. Our goal is to get that user interface code abstracted away in such a manner that it can be a GUI or it could be, you know, some kind of REST API that's returning results over JSON or, you know, who knows. So a good way to start is to create an abstraction for our user interface. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in another file. So I've got that over here, the UI.h and our main CPP. We're going to have our main CPP include this user interface header. We'll put it over here in our project so we can see it in the IDE. And we will build everything. OK, so now we see. In the Solution Explorer, we've got the user interface over here. Why did it not find it? That was weird. OK, here it is. And we are including that from the main file. We're not doing anything with it yet. But what we did just do is we just validated this new file we added. The build system is happy. And the syntax of whatever we added in here is happy. So this is another good time to add ui.h, main.cpp, our CMake list. And just get that committed. So again, we don't have any automated tests. We run the risk of breaking something 
So proceed in small, careful steps. And every time you make some forward progress, just commit that off to version control. So now we want to be calling these things on our user interface abstraction instead of directly on these functions. So what we're going to do is going to, let's take the signature of this function, put it over on our user interface, make it appear virtual. And I'm going to cheat a little bit for now. I'm going to put the console UI directly in this header that describes the abstraction. <laughs> Give it a default constructor, a default destructor. Now, I typed that, but again, resharper. Let's get rid of the red squiggle. That's a syntax error. Resharper is saying, hey, um, I ran a modernized check from Clang Tidy on your code. And Clang Tiny suggests that if you have virtual functions in a derived class that match the signature of the base class, the compiler will make those functions virtual, but you should declare them override or final uh, in order to make sure that you're getting a matching signature. So we will apply the fix it to use override. I was typing it because I know these uh, kind of my fingers remember these things, but we can use resharper to do that for us. And now that little squiggle's gone away. And what we we also need to do is we need to implement this method that we added here in the interface because so far this is an abstract class that can't be instantiated. So our goal is to get our console UI moved over into this class that implements the abstract UI one piece at a time. So this is the first piece we're going to move over. Now, ReSharper has, uh, and by the way, to bring this, there's this little light bulb over here that you can click on to get refactoring options selected by ReSharper, or you can just press Alt-Enter. That's what I'm doing to make it show up. But we can generate overriding members or generate missing members. Overriding members is what we want because we want to implement an override for the pure virtual methods on the base. It shows you the methods that we haven't implemented yet, of which there's only one, so we can just say finish. So it creates the declaration. And let's go and give us a source file to put these definitions in. So we'll make a new file, C++ source file. We're going to include ui.h. We're going to save this. We're going to call it ui.cpp. Go back over to our CMake list and add, just kind of start spacing these out a little bit, ui.cpp. So we've got a source file that includes the header. We've got a reference to the new files that, that we just added in our CMake list. And now if I compile the CMake list to rebuild the project, it now knows about this ui.cpp file. And the reason that I did that is because ReSharper, it uses the project model in Visual Studio to understand where things should go. So if I tell it now to generate an implementation, it matched up UI.h with UI.cpp and moved the implementation into the CPP file. You also have, uh, if I undo this, you also, there's an option to generate an inline implementation if you want 
to have it here in the header. Uh, another, once you've done this, is if you've got an inline implementation and it gets too long, you want to move it out of the source file, you can move implementation out of class scope and that will bring it over here. So there's different ways you can get here incrementally or all at once. So what we want to do, we've started building this abstraction and a concrete implementation of it. And about all we know so far is if we compile, it compiles with no errors, but we're not actually trying to instantiate this class yet. We feel pretty confident that we've supplied definitions for all the, the pure virtual uh, members that we need to, but let's double check that by instantiating this user interface. So down here in our main, let's say console UI UI. So we're just instantiating it. We're not using it yet. So that just tells us this concrete implementation of our abstract interface is complete. So that's another good time. We just took a bunch of steps. We could have committed at several of those steps along the way, but this I think is a good point to say, let's add our new source file, changes to our header, changes to main, changes to our build description. And just get that committed off so we have a, a safety backstop. Okay. Now, if we look at this show gallows, it's a nice function in the sense that it has no side effects. It is a pure function. It's only side effect is output, I should say, to be technically accurate. But it, it has no side effects on any state of the game. It, it takes this error count as an input and then switches on that and does some, some output based on that. So if we said now, let's take all this code So I, I, I'm uh, taking everything except the that initial static keyword because I don't want that on my class member. I've copied that. I can come over here and now take, let's just do it like this. I'll paste it. I'll go back up here and fix the signature like that. Oh, now I see that I need to include IO stream to get C out referenced. Okay, that looks good. Oh, and I need down here, there's, sorry for the quick scroll. Down here, there's use of uh, runtime error. So we should include stood except to get that. If I go back to the main here, now let's, we can, uh, if you click on this little minus, it'll collapse the definition down to just the declaration. The uh, keystroke equivalent is control M, control M. So I can collapse this, delete that. Now resharpers analyze my code and notice like, hey, you're calling a function that doesn't exist. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, we can say ui.showgallows. To fix that, click the, the red circle icon again, UI show gallows. One more time, UI show gallows. Now we're back to green. We try building this. And that seems good. Let's go and we one thing we haven't been doing as we've been making these changes, because so far the changes we've been making have been additions and they're uh, targets for where we're going to move code. And this is the first time we actually moved some code that's part of the program. So let's go back over here to our build directory and run the game and see if it, it looks like it's printing out okay. Everything looks fine. Let's do it again, but start putting wrong guesses in. Okay, looks good. So back to our source directory. Looks to me like we successfully moved this first piece of code 
that was a global function, this show gallows function, it was a function. Now it's a concrete implementation on our abstract user interface. I did F12 to go from the usage to the definition, by the way. If I do F12 again, it'll take me to the declaration of that function. And one nice thing about ReSharper is it gives you the ability to navigate the class hierarchy. So if I go Alt Home, it takes me to the base class. If I go Alt End, it takes me to derived classes. In this case, we only have one derived class, so it didn't bother to show me a pop-up saying which derived class containing an override do you care about. It took me straight to the override. So those um, F12 is just Visual Studio will also take you to definition between definitions and declarations in plain Visual Studio. But uh, ReSharper's uh, code navigation is improved over what Visual Studio gives you. So that's also a nice handy thing that we've got from ReSharper. So if we go back and look at our code here, let's give ourselves another backstop. And I am handy or are comfortable rather doing, you know, Git operations from the command line. But there's also in Visual Studio, there's a thing called, let's see if I can find it here, Team Explorer. And Team Explorer integrates with Git and it knows that um, that is the wrong repository. Let's add. All right, so this Hangman repository, it integrates with Git as well, and I can do the add. It's Here's it showing I've got changes to main CPP and UI CPP. I can do the commit message from here if I want to. Commit staged. Okay, so there's different ways of working with these things. There's always lots of different ways. Uh, I'm just handy with the command line, so I like to do things that way. If we look, go back over here and do a git status, no changes, they've been staged. So you can operate either way. Um, the Team Explorer business is handy if you're working with um, repositories on GitHub, because you can, um, in Visual Studio, you can just say, open the project from GitHub, and it'll go clone it from GitHub, and then you can... Um, open a solution if they've got that committed, or you can do a CMake build to get the, the build going. Anyway, so we've successfully moved this off into our user interface. So let's just continue with that. Um, another nice navigation feature is if I do Shift F12, that shows me usages of the symbol that I was um, Pressing Shift F12 on, it's showing here the, the, the three different call sites of that method. So that can be handy when trying to figure out, I'm looking at this piece of code, who's calling this code? Um, it's a question you often need to answer when you're trying to understand code that you didn't write. So um, we got some more output here with this show guesses. That's a good candidate for moving over next. So let's try that. Let's try it a different way. This time, let's say, um, instead of creating the declaration and moving the implementation to fulfill the declaration, let's change the usage and create the definition and the uh, declaration from the usage. So I've got two calls to show guesses here. I've switched them both to be method calls on this class. And you can see it's made it red and I've got a little um, light bulb over here that's saying create member function show guesses yeah that's what we want to do and it created this signature based on the usage and it's showing me a box here to say um, as near as I can tell based on your usage this function doesn't return a value so it's guessing that the initial return type is void but if I wanted to, I can edit this to make it int or whatever I want. Um, this is often handy if you're creating from usage and the thing it returns is a reference 
uh, and you want to make sure that it is a const a reference to const or something like that. And now it's prompting me for the signature of the arguments that it guessed based on the usage. And it is prompting me for the name of the arguments. In this case, I think uh, guesses is what we called it. Go back over here to our usage. Let's get this out of the way. OK. This show guesses was taking a string called guesses. Now notice this thing is grayed out. And it's saying nobody's using this function. So what we can do is take this body, navigate back to here, say generate an implementation, and then replace this empty implementation with that's interesting. I think that's a lie. No match for, oh, because I haven't included string. Ha, ha, wasn't a lie. OK, but because I had to include string here, this probably means that I'm missing it in my header. If we go to the declaration for this function, oh, look, it, it included x string for me. That's, that's odd. That's weird. It tries when you, when you, uh, Create from usage, it tries to guess which headers it should include to get the declarations for the types in the signature of the function that you've created from usage. So it, for some reason, it thought I needed to include, include x string to get the definition of std string instead of just string. That's, that's a bug that I should file on ReSharper to get them to correct that. I'm just going to write a note here. But wasn't too difficult to sort out. Now, if we go back here, this function isn't being used anymore, so we can delete that. And we are calling it on our implementation, but we know this is not quite what we want. We wanted it up on our uh, interface. And that's because our code is interacting with the concrete class and not the abstract interface. So we're going to make note of that and come back to that in a second. And as you're doing these uh, extensive restructurings, this is a good example of a situation where you notice something isn't quite the way you want it to be in the final version. You just make note of it on a, on a piece of paper uh, or use the task list inside I think it's control backslash T gives you a task list in Visual Studio. We can, I thought there was an add task button. I think that task list, I, I know there's a way to add tasks to it. I just don't, I, I don't use it that often. So I don't remember exactly how to do that. But there is a task list thing in, in Visual Studio that you can use. Or you can just keep notes on a piece of paper make notes of the things that you want to improve, but that you're not doing at the moment. And then when we come to the next thing, we can pick off that list. Uh, I'm just going to keep it in my head because I've done this exercise before, so I know where we're going. So we are, to recap, this ended up when we created this function from an example usage, it ended up on our concrete class instead of on our interface because we were in the place where we were using uh, the, the uh, user interface, we were interacting to with the concrete class and not with the abstract class. So it put the usage on the concrete class. We will fix that in a minute. But right now is a good time to make sure that this code, what's the problem here? Uh, it's saying it noticed that this method, which we declared as an instance method, and it hasn't yet turned into an override of a virtual method, which requires it to be an instance method. So because it's not an override, and it doesn't use any member variables in the implementation, ReSharper has noticed, hey, this thing could be a static method. So it's put the little green squiggles underneath there. All of these things, by the way, you can configure if you're like, but it's, this is really annoying. I don't, I don't want this. You can go down here to inspection 
member function may be static. You can disable it once at this location. You configure it to be, you know, never shown or shown only as a hint or a suggestion or as a warning or an error. Um, so you can, all these things that it's suggesting to you, you can adjust them in terms of their level of, of chattiness and, and nagginess. And I should also mention that me personally, I can't stand pop-up windows unless I ask for them. So for instance, this kind of thing, I'm pressing a keystroke here, Alt-Enter to get that to pop up. But unless I type the keystroke, I don't want to see that. Because many times as I'm restructuring code, it's in an intermediate state where it won't even compile, never mind be something that meets all these little checks that ReSharper is going to run on my code. So I don't want things popping up in the middle while I'm working and interrupting my flow. So me personally, I've got all the options set to turn off all those pop-ups and suggestions and list boxes that can come up automatically. Now that's kind of a uh, advanced mode of working with ReSharper. Uh, when you install it at first, it's going to have all those little pop-ups turned on by default. And you may find that useful to get yourself oriented in the, the features that ReSharper is offering you and the things that it can do at various locations. But it's like training wheels, right? Once you learn how to ride that bicycle, you want to go fast and take the corners. You got to get rid of those training wheels. So that I just mentioned that that's where I'm at uh, with my usage of ReSharper. I've got all the training wheels turned off. And it's not that I don't avail myself of the extra help. It's just that I only want that help to appear when it is called upon and not just because it's like, hey, I noticed you're trying to write a letter, you know, kind of thing. I don't want clippy type assistance. Okay, so we modified some files. We moved this method off into the concrete implementation. We should at least see if this stuff builds to see if we made any mistakes. That looks good. Now's a good time to also come back here and test it. The guesses are showing up. Okay, that looks good. The part that we changed was this code that was displaying this line here. So that all looks uh, correct still. So we can go back here. We got everything added. And what we moved was show guesses if I this thing yeah so we moved it um, there's a bunch of these refactorings they have common kind of standardized names move method is one that where um, refers to taking some code that's on one class or as a global function and moving it onto another class and that's exactly what we just did but we weren't too happy with this because we wanted this to be a virtual method. So what we can do is take this, cut it from here, paste it over here, make it a virtual. If I could spell virtual correctly, there we go. Make that a virtual. Then we can come back here and say generate overriding members like we did before. Show guesses is the override. What happened? I think it got confused. Let's try this again. Overriding members, or maybe I didn't click the button just quite right. Finish. There we go. Okay. So now, now of course that only affected the declaration, not the definition. But you notice when we came back over here to the definition, the green squiggle went away because now, oh, uh, can't be, can't be suggesting to you to make that method static anymore because now it's an override method and override methods have to be instance methods. They can't be static. So we cleaned up that little mess in our implementation, but we're going to do this again. So how can we avoid doing that, having to, to fix this up again? Let's just first double check our little safety backstop to make sure things are working good. Let's go over here run the game okay looks good i don't even need to keep running it so all we did was change that header right because we moved the method to the interface changed the derived class to have an override okay 
Now, we know we're going to be doing this again because there's more user interface stuff. So what we can do instead of interacting directly with this console UI is let's change the signature of this function. I'm going to do that with the, I did the keystroke, control R, control S, but we can go over here and where do they have it? On the context menu here. So if I just context click, there's refactor, change signature, control RS was the shortcut. If we change signature of this method, what we can do is we can add a UI reference called UI. And let's just make it the first argument instead of the last argument. So we're changing the signature of this function. This function has call sites. Now it's asking me, hey, uh, where this function is called, what do you want me to do at the call site? And I'm going to tell it, use UI, the token UI, as the argument. I could use curly braces, or I could just leave it unchanged and fix it yourself, but I'm going to use that. So now I've got an argument called UI that is a reference to the pure interface. This local is now shadowing that argument. I'm going to delete this local. I'm going to I actually cut it instead of just deleting it. I'm going to go over to the call site. And I'm going to move that over there. So what did we just do? What we just did is all this code that has the game logic and it's interacting with our user interface, we just decoupled it from our concrete user interface class. And we did it in a tricky way. You notice there was um, the fact that I used this name, U lowercase ui, as the same name as I was using for my local variable let me change the signature and cut the uh, instantiation of the concrete UI class from this function and paste it down here where that function was called. So that's just a trick that I've learned in using ReSharper is there's various ways you can do transformations on code where you get the resharper tooling to help you with part of it. And then the other part of it is just kind of coincidental naming and things like that that you do in order to, to get the transformation to be as automated as possible. Notice I didn't retype this and I didn't have to manually edit any of the call sites. I didn't have to manually edit this function signature and I didn't have to manually edit this call site where that function was being called. So I, even though I had to do some manual, excuse me, some manual steps, those manual steps were cut and paste moving of whole lines of code. So we think we just made a transformation that's good. Let's at least check to see if code builds. All right, that looks good. Let's go back over here to our build directory. Let's just build debug. Let's run the game. Okay, looking good. Okay, if we look over here, all we did was a change to main.cpp where we changed the signature of this function, moved this instantiation of this variable into the caller. So let's add that. Let's do that exercise again, but now since we're, we're going to create a method from a usage, but now it should be coupled through the abstract class. So the next piece of UI that we got going on in our function, we're just kind of working from top to bottom here. The next thing is to get some input from the user. 
this thing is doing console input. So far, we moved methods that did console output. So let's go over here. Sorry. Let's go over here and say, make this a new method from usage on the UI abstract class. So create member function get guess. Now it's creating it on the abstract class. The return type is care. That's good. It's not smart enough to know that it's a virtual method, so we still have to do that ourselves. And we'll give this guy a declaration. It's got a squiggle because we don't have a definition for it yet. Function get guess not, is not implemented, but that's okay because we're about to steal the implementation from the other file. So we'll go back over here to main. And here's get guess now being flagged as not being used. We're just going to cut this whole thing out. Go back over to our implementation. I'm just pasting now. And I'm going to cheat. I'm going to take this class name part, put that on there, delete this static, and why is it saying this isn't used? Oh, it's just colored it weird. Okay, so if we go back, here's the interesting. Okay, let's find out. So that should be OK now. It's telling me this guess can be a const, so we can just do that. Ooh, now it's const. OK. So if we drill into this definition with F12, it takes us to the abstract class. If we do Alt-End to go to derived implementations, here's the derived implementation. So I think that's all good. Let's try building this. Build looks good. Let's try running it. It's looking good. So we have a new method on the interface and on the implementation class. We moved that method from a global function to a method on the concrete implementation. And this is where we moved it from. Move method, get guess. OK. So things are starting to shape up. We're starting piece by piece. We're getting all the user interface code for the console off into this implementation file. And little by little, the let's see, where's that used? OK, that's used in the game logic. Little by little, this main.cpp is becoming only the game logic. Now, here we've got a little piece of inline user interface. It's not abstracted out into a function yet. So let's do that. We can highlight this piece of code, and then off the context menu, we can say refactor extract method. It calls it extract method, but it, it's in this case, it's just going to turn it into a function, yeah, as you can see here. And uh, what is what is this doing? This is, oops, uh, it's already guessed. Oops, why is it's lost my keyboard focus for some reason. Wanted to stay in the editor window. Let's try this again. This time I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut, Control R M. There we go. Now it's highlighted, and this is already guessed. Um, this type of this argument is a little wacky. To take a value type as const is just it's a weirdness in C plus plus that on a class, you can take a value type and declare it const 
in the implementation of the method. And then in the declaration of the method, you declare the value type as not const. It's just a little asymmetry. But in this case, since it's, a, it's extracting it into a function, this const is OK because it's basically saying within this implementation, we're not going to modify this argument. Um, it's just a little weird, though. People don't normally do that. I, I just deleted it but we could I, manually, but we could have also gone over here to change signature and just gotten rid of the const over here by just saying change that const care to just a care. Uh, but we wanted that as a function, and now that it's a function, we can turn this into a method call and do the same thing that we did before. Let's make, we can make this virtual void right here as we're doing that, and instead of making it, look, it's kind of, told me that the const specifier here is kind of stupid, so we can take that out. Just be care, and then make this appear virtual. Go over here to the implementation, generate overriding member, finish that off. That's good. Go over here to this body, delete it from here navigate over to the interface and the derived guy and then say generate the implementation and then take that code and paste it in all right so we just did another create from usage after we extracted that little piece of user interface into a local function so let's Double check everything's still working. Okay, you already guessed A. That's working correctly. Oops. Okay, check this. We'll add everything. Let's just kind of take a look at our diff to see. Oh. What we did here, because uh, we extracted this function already guessed. All right. Moving along. You can start to see now, this is becoming our game logic code. It's, it's incrementally getting completely decoupled from the user interface. It's still procedural in nature. It's not event driven so it's not yet been completely transformed into an event driven ui it is still very much coupled to a procedurally oriented ui if you will um, there are tricks to make those two mesh together um, but let's just keep looking and see what we need to decouple next this is all game logic there's no input or output there Here's a little bit of UI, but it's already decoupled. And here's our last little bit of UI. So let's extract that into a method and we'll call it U1. We'll put this on the instance. Here's the little function that got extracted. We'll kind of go a little faster this time. We'll just cut that out, go inside here, create member, virtual, pure virtual, Gen generate overriding, generate implementation, paste, delete that one line, let's just double check everything real quick. I won. Okay. Let's 
so it was U1 was the method that we extracted. All right, now, over here in this main code, this, net, this code is now, it's talking to a user interface through an abstraction. Uh, and if we also, also notice here, like these argc and argv, they're just left over from the fact that we extracted this function from our initial implementation of main. So really, let's rename this to just hangman. And let's change the signature to drop these arguments because they aren't being used. So now we are instantiating our UI and we are returning the result of the game interacting with the UI. Let's just make sure everything's still good. Go back over here to our build. Looks good. That only changed the main CPP. Okay, so now everything that we have over here is game logic. It's still kind of crufty because it's just in a global function. However, what we can do now that it's coupled to an abstract user interface class, if we wanted to write a test against this game logic, we could mock the user interface to create scenarios that provide a complete description of what the user's input is and what the expectation of the game is based on the input that is supplied. So if I mock out this user interface function or user interface class rather, if we go over here and look at the declaration, mock this out so that I say get guess is going to return the same guess twice. Then I can set up an expectation to say that when I return the same guess twice from get guess, already guess, already guessed should be called. Similarly, you can set up get guess to return a sufficient number of bad guesses for our test word and verify that it should not call u1 and that it should call show gallows with the correct error count increasing up to six now one thing that we haven't done over here this is a function that's used in our game logic down here okay so that function is used in our game logic so this code here is part of the game logic this is not part of the game logic. So another thing that I could do is instead of calling this function just with the UI, I could change the signature of this function to add an argument and let's give it a reference to a constant string. And this is word. Actually, let's, let's do it a different way. See, I've got word locally here. That is the word uh, that we're going to guess. Let's try something like this. Let's take this whole body and extract a function. And because the code that I've selected is using word and it's using the user interface, ReSharper has suggested that the new function I'm extracting has to take those two things as arguments. So we can, let's call this play hangman. Just for now, we can rename it later. So now this word business has now been pulled out of our game. This business of selecting the word rather 
has been pulled out of our game logic. And let's see if we can go a little bit sneakier. Nope. I was going to see if it would inline this for me. But what I can do is because this signature is just passing the argument along to play Hangman, I can take this stuff and just paste it down here. I did some stuff manually there, so let's just build to make sure we didn't screw anything up. Now we can go back and just call this, we can rename this back to Hangman. And what I ended up doing is, I, there's a number of different ways that I could have done that. I did it with extract method to get this argument up here. I also could have done it with change signature. Let's be nice and make this a constant string ref. which I think is good. We were only using that word as an input and not modifying it locally in our game logic. So now we've got our game. We've got it decoupled from our user interface completely. We've also got it decoupled from the mechanism that's used to select the words that will be um, presented to the player for guessing in the game. So I can now pull this thing out. I mean, I already had it extracted as a function but I, if I wanted to provide it a set of different ways of um, abstracting that, suppose I want to turn this into a two-player game where player one picks the word and player two has to guess, then this could turn into an interface with a method that selects the word, and that interface could do um, uh, a rest call to the other player or some kind of network connection or whatever, so then it would enable network uh, player versus player playing as opposed to player versus computer where and i could switch this to you know return from a specific list of words or it could return from well a dictionary in this case it's just a list of words because we don't care about the definitions of the words we only care about the words themselves so we're now in a good place to write unit tests around this code and if we needed to modify this code, like not particularly happy about this six in here, what, you know, like what is the six? Why is it six? The reason it's six is because in our little representation of the stick figure, we've got one, two, the head, the body, the arms, and the legs. So that's two, four, six body parts. That's why it's six. But I've got this six hard coded over here. What if I wanted to have, you know, a more elaborate um, hangman representation where I've got, you know, upper arm and lower arm and upper leg and lower leg, then this six isn't going to be right. So it's hard coded in here. There's this, that six appears there and it appears down here. So let's try another thing. Let's take this and extract variable. And resharper's like, do you want to replace just the one occurrence? But I noticed there's a second one. Do you want to replace both? Let's replace both. And let's call this a const int that is num body parts. And if we wanted to be, because it's connect, it's coupled to the user interface. If we wanted to be really good, we could then take this and extract, you know, get num body parts. and then do move method like we did before on the other stuff. But I think this gives you an idea of a different way to look at your code when you're trying to reach a goal. Your goal is, as our little product, our little description of our problem was, you know, the boss is like, hey, you know, all we need to do is just slap a new user interface on this code. It should be easy, right? And if you've ever done a user interface code, you know that that's almost always false <laughs> because the user interface code is the part of the code that changes the most often because it's directly influenced by the preferences of the users as opposed to this game logic, which is the same whether we're doing REST APIs or a mobile game or whether doing a console application or a GUI, this game logic doesn't change. But 
to decouple things, we had to make a series of transformations on the code. So when you have to go through these sorts of changes, think of your code, a way to think of the code is to think of it in a more abstract way, like almost just like a mathematical sequence of symbols. And your goal is to apply a successive sequence of transformations on that symbol set or that symbol sequence rather to get from point A to point B. And we don't, when we don't have tests, making those transformations can be dangerous. So I was, that's why I was going out of my way to make sure that we would frequently come back to Git and lock in changes. I've got some changes here right now, right? Where I've got this thing extracted out, this get numb body parts. And, you know, what if like the boss comes back and says, nope, it's always going to be six body parts. This is your, your gold plating, something that doesn't need to change. And we say, okay, great. Let's just get rid of those changes. Come back over here. It's back to being a hard coded six. Just double check that everything's good. It builds fine. And. Seems to run okay. So you can think of refactoring and remember that what's the difference between refactoring and other code changes that you make. Refactoring changes the structure of your code without changing the behavior of your code. And, and that you can put behavior in quotes because obviously we move some things around and there's going to be observable differences. You know, the set of CPU instructions is not identical in the new binary like it was in the old binary, but the semantic behavior is preserved. The game still works. The console UI still works, but we're now in a situation where we can start working on that graphical UI that the boss wanted. And we can do that in such a way that we're not going to break the console UI. Now, I mentioned console UI is more uh, immediate query by the program style as opposed to event driven. And you might say, how can I mesh these two approaches to a user interface that seem completely different in the console UI, the program implements main in a, in a GUI. Usually your GUI framework implements main and I've got things like I am, you know, reading from standard input that's blocking input. What do I, how do I reconcile that with event driven UI, UI and it's not pretty, but basically what you can do is you can put a message loop in here that pumps messages until the necessary input has been obtained and then it returns control to the caller and from the caller's perspective it looks like a blocking call it blocked until uh, the user input was supplied but because we had a message loop in there we didn't stop processing messages so if they were going to the help menu or whatever those messages would still get processed and dispatched to your other parts of your GUI but as far as the game logic is concerned, this is like, hey, I'm just waiting for your guests. Let me know when you got it. So there are ways to do that. And it, it's not pretty. Um, but there are even ways to make uh, a program that was expecting to be in control and having, you know, kind of linear user input, changing that to event driven based user input. It It is possible. It doesn't. It's not the code you would have ended up with had you started from scratch saying, I'm going to need a console UI and an event driven GUI at the same time, but you don't always know all the requirements you're going to need in the end at the beginning. So I hope that gives you an idea of how to do this sort of decoupling. Uh, some key takeaways are proceed in small steps. If you, all you have is manual testing, make sure you do those manual that manual testing at those intermediate steps. Use the automated tools as much as you can because you're less likely to make mistakes when the um, changes that you're making are the result of 
cut and paste or automated transformations from ReSharper or any other refactoring tool. Use your version control system to lock in forward progress. So if you get stuck, you haven't lost much work. You've only lost back to the last commit that you made. And um, the key to decoupling code from each other is to use abstractions. In this case, we used a pure virtual interface. So we use dynamic polymorphism. It's also possible to do this using static polymorphism and templates. It's a little more involved and the assistance from ReSharper isn't um, as nice. So it's a little, uh, you have to go more carefully, but that is also doable. If for some reason, dynamic polymorphism, you know, just isn't an option. There are times when that is the case. It wasn't the case here. So that was the easiest thing to do. And that pretty much wraps it up. If, if there's any questions, we can go to that. I'll mention that um, JetBrains, the people who made ReSharper, did not sponsor this meetup. I have purchased my own copy of ReSharper because I think it's awesome. You can get a 30-day trial of both ReSharper and CLion. CLion is their C++ IDE for Linux, Mac, and Windows. Um, so you can try these things for free for 30 days. I think if you do lots of C++, that after 30 days of using it, you'll find it pretty indispensable. But that's just me. I, I, like, I, loved, I love the product. But if there's uh, no other, no questions or anything, we will end it there. Okay. Thanks well, for. Thanks. Thank you. Stop the recording.